But joining us now is our friend. Uh, it's Friday, so it must be time for Dr. David Samadhi, Chairman of Urology and Chief of Robotic Surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital, also Professor of Urology at Hofstra North Shore LIJ School of Medicine. Hello, Dr. Samadhi. Hey, Steve. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good, thank you. I hope you had a easy week this week. It was so hot outside. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I know. Even walking the few blocks, you know, to, to the transportation, it's uh, just unbearable. But let me, let me, let me ask you about that. Um, uh, we all know stay high. I mean, we're at the end of the heat wave here in the Northeast. Apparently, this, this today might even be it. But uh, in general, we know we need to drink liquids, uh, but we need to drink liquids before we go out, not once we start feeling woozy or sweaty. But uh, And also tell me about um, anger and tempers and road rage. It seems that uh, uh, the statistics show that when it's oppressively hot, uh, people are more apt to have short tempers. Well, it's very interesting because there are some studies even from like 10 years ago that shows like summertime is when all of this uh, rage and um, anger uh, picks up. People are frustrated. Some of it is because of the direct effect of heat on the brain. But the, the other is the fact that you may not be able to sleep well at nighttime because of air conditioning and it's uncomfortable. So the combination of lack of sleep and everything else, you know, it adds up. And we p see people are very cranky. They're upset. They're angry. The traffic and everything else adds up. So, you know, what I would say is you're absolutely right. You want to make sure that you load up and you're well hydrated. Part of the heat is not so much the, the, the weather itself, but the humidity. Our defense mechanism and the sweating mechanism is like our own natural air conditioning system, whereby sweating, you get rid of the heat. If there's humidity outside and you're not able to sweat, you keep that heat inside you. And when the core temperature reaches to about 103, 104, that's when you're going to have a real heat stroke. And you can go from being feeling fine to a little uh, dizzy or headache and soon confusion and people can pass out if their blood pressure really drops. So your advice is absolutely very important, Make sure, making sure that you continuously keep cool, stay in the air conditioning. If you don't have it, go to the malls and make sure you know you, you stay cool. One of the big advice that I have to people, unfortunately a story that came out last week about a year old kid that died in the car. As a result, the parents left him and within a few minutes, unfortunately, the kid passed away from like the heat. Please make sure you don't do this because children are very susceptible to this. And the elderly who take blood pressure medications, they're on diuretics, they take heart medications, they may want to talk to their doctors on days like this when it's so hot, and they may want to skip some of those medications to keep the blood pressure stable. That's interesting. Yeah, also, I mean, uh, obviously children. I mean, it's a tragedy when that happens, uh, but also animals and pets. I mean, I, I, I just saw a story today, a woman's charged with uh, her dog died by leaving it in the car. So you got to be very careful. Let's move on, uh, Doc. Um, I'm looking at this Fox News story, and it's a study published in Nature Medicine. Researchers injected a compound into obese mice that increased production of the muscle protein, REV, uh, ERB, which is known to have an impact on sleep and on animals' uh, internal biological clocks. And basically, the question is, if this works on humans, um, can you get the benefits of exercise uh, <laughs> from a pill, or would that possibly affect weight but not necessarily, I mean, I don't see how a pill could give you cardio benefits or, or other benefits uh, related to, to blood, uh, blood uh, uh, levels of certain sugars and glucose and triglycerides and other things. What, what's the deal? Well, one of these days I'm going to call you Dr. Marsberg. <laughs> I think like you, you've read and you've studied this stuff so well that you know. Uh, I'm, a hypo, I'm a devout <laughs> hypochondriac, Doc. i got to study this stuff. You're excellent. You're great. And, and you're absolutely right. First of all, it's a mice study, and any of these research studies coming all the way to the human level and clinical trials would take years, and we'll see these studies come and go. But the big message is, yes, we can give you and, and work with the genetic study and modify some of the genes to make sure that the mice can lose weight and, and build up muscle. But you're right, the obesity is not just sitting, stand alone. It's a combination of the, the diabetes that works, the high blood pressure, the vascular disease, and all of that is not going to go away. We just, you know, manipulating genes in people. So I think in this particular situation, the old-fashioned exercise and some of the uh, recommendation by Dr. Bloomberg of taking stairways instead of ele elevators, <coughs> cutting down on soda and sugar, all of those are healthy. Uh, not to be regulated by the mayor, but 
you know, we just need to watch the portions that we're eating. Those are much more effective with a cardiovascular than, than this. I don't know what the future of this research is going to be. It's an interesting one. We're certainly learning more about the genetics and the genes that are involved in obesity. Uh, so it's a, it's a step forward, but we have a long way to go before we start injecting people instead of exercise. Well, I want to stick with mice. We're talking to Dr. David Samadhi, uh, Chairman of Urology and Chief of Robotic Surgery at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York, also Professor of Urology at Hofstra North Shore LIJ School of Medicine. Um, a, a, a team of Boston uh, at Boston Children's Hospital um, found that, uh, that uh, a, gen a rare genetic mutation could be linked to severe obesity. It's been identified by researchers who conducted experiments again on mice, as I alluded to, um, and uh, they, they found that mice with the genetic mutation gained weight even though they ate the same amount of food as mice without the mutation, and the gene appears to be involved in re regulating metabolism and food consumption. So could there so, be? Yeah, I mean, I think that they're up to something, and I always believe that we're all, even though we may look the same, but we're all extremely different genetically and our infrastructure, as far as like the whole ge genetic map is very different. Why is it that 10 people can eat the same amount of food, same number of calories, do the same kind of exercise, half of them are gonna be obese and the other half are gonna be in good shape. So there's no question that um, as a result of evolution, our genes and the structures are different. This is one of those examples where you see that the mice are completely built genetically different, they have different structures. So I think there's some value to this. And you know, as a medical doctors, despite the fact that we talk about healthy diet and exercise, some always do better than others. And I think gene plays a big role. Um, we always look for excuses or diagnosis and uh, hypothyroid. Maybe there's a problem with the thyroid or diabetes. But this is an example of how genetics can play a role. And I hope this will turn out to be a real entity and we can apply that in the, the, the human. All right. I, I got another one for you here. Um, and uh, this is, uh, by the way, I, I did cut my fish oil pills down from two to three a, a day, uh, from three to uh, two a day. You said three grams a day. Is that what you said last week? That's what most people are. Okay. are, are that's the, the upper limit of it. But The uh, upper limit, yeah. Okay. But I just wanted to, that was an aside. But here's a study of older men who had died from causes other than prostate cancer, and almost half were found to have had prostate tumors. Uh, yes. So, so, I mean, is this that, you know, that, that they say if you live long enough as a man, you're going to get prostate cancer. So what does this mean? What it means is that if, if every 80-year-old man that walks into my office right now, if we biopsy every one of them, Half of those guys are going to have prostate cancer, but they're the type of prostate cancer that are slow growing and they're not going to hurt them. Ten minutes ago, I saw a gentleman, 42 year old, with prostate cancer. He has 30 years, 40 years ahead of him. So, case by case, different patients, different type of prostate cancers have to be treated different. When you get to the age of 75 or 80, we're not going to be very aggressive because you will die with that cancer, but not from it. On the other hand, if you're much younger, if you're in your, in your 40s, 50s, you have prostate cancer, that could be clinically significant enough to, to get you, and you can die from this. Still, 30,000 men die every year from prostate cancer, and the big message is not every prostate cancer is the same. Some are slow growing and some are more aggressive, so we gotta take patient by patient, but in general, once you pass over the age of 75, most prostate cancers are not going to really, you're not going to die from this. Um, you may die from heart, heart attack or cardiovascular, et cetera. And that's what the message from this. Right. And just keep Always getting, keep, keep, in, yeah. keep getting the PSA test and keep getting the uh, digital exam once a year, I guess, right? You got it. Okay. Doctor, have a great weekend. Stay cool, my friend. Thank you. Same here, too. Thank uh, you, all right. Steve. My pleasure, Dr. David Samadhi, Chairman of Urology and Chief of Robotic Surgery at